So hello and, we and welcome. Is the sound okay? It sounds a bit over saturated. Okay. So hello and welcome to my talk. So topic is use Flask. Might sound familiar to people who use React hooks, but the uh, topic of my talk is use Flask or how to use the React front end for your Flask app. A bit about me, like you already said, my name is Adrian, or online usually handle at Thiefmaster, you can find me in various places, and I'm the lead developer of the Indico project at CERN, a 17-year-old project now, which actually was used to host EuroPython 2006, and we still have the timetable from the conference back then. Yeah, also, I'm one of the maintainers of the Palettes project, which is Flask, Werkzeug, Chincha, and some more tools. So I'm mostly hanging out there on the IRC and Discord channel, helping with the issue tracker, sometimes even writing code for it, but not as often as I would like to. But yeah, it's just with Flask, great project. And I'm a Python enthusiast since almost 10 years now. I started with a small hobby project. My first thought back then was actually, ah, oh, this language has uh, indentation for blocks. That seems to be weird. But in the end, I started loving it. And I'm proud to say that, uh, well, around a year ago, I finally moved on from jQuery to React. And honestly, I don't want to look back. So a bit about the status quo instead in case of technology is used mostly in the Flask ecosystem. This information is mostly based on uh, uh, what I'm seeing uh, people ask about on IRC. So I'm sure there are some bigger projects out there that, of course, do also many more customized things. But this is about uh, what probably most people do, because those are the typical people asking questions as well. So I'm going to talk a bit about the main four pieces uh, many applications use. So it's WT forms, um, jQuery, Ajax, and well, JavaScript, which is kind of cover in also jQuery. But yeah, you always have people who think JavaScript and jQuery are both different languages. Anyway, starting with WT forms, well, it's quite uh, nice to use actually. It's easy for a simple case. So if you have a small application where you just want to put a form, have some validation, maybe generate the HTML for it, it's great. It's declarative. You don't have to do much. It does a job for you. So yeah, great library. You should use it if you do a small application that's mostly static. The problem is, uh, uh, let's say you have something more complex, maybe uh, some custom widget. I mean, for example, if you're organizing a conference, you might have a widget where you select speakers, provide information about them, maybe uh, what kind of roles they are, if they're a speaker or just an author. Well, now you are dealing with probably a list of dictionaries or some other formats that can hold all this data. So you're submitting the data and, hmm, great. Now uh, there's a validation error. Maybe because the user entered something he shouldn't have entered and it wasn't caught on the client side. Well, anyway, what are you going to do now? Ideally, you don't want to lose the data, but just show an error and re-render the form. So you do a round trip with the value, because it comes from the clients, and WT forms converts it to a format more suitable for Python, and then has to convert back to a value suitable for the HTML form field. Now, if validation failed, you might not have data. You can properly convert back to the format the client-side code expects. So um, what are you going to do? Uh, show the previous data you had in the database when editing, show nothing. I think both are not great cases because, I mean, if you then don't notice it and save again, you might lose data. Of course, you can say garbage in, garbage out, but in that case, you really need good client-side validation, which you might not always have, even so you should. Then next one, jQuery. Let me ask you a question first. Do you in here still uh, use jQuery nowadays or want to use jQuery nowadays? Okay, not too many. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, some years ago, jQuery was really great. I mean, you didn't have to deal with, let's say, IE6 particularities, which I'm sure everybody got to laugh. But nowadays, I mean, there are not that many reasons for it. I mean, for something small, you can still easily use it, but the DOM provides the same functionality as well. 
And the risk of using jQuery is if it's bigger, you easily get spaghetti code because you have selectors and IDs and classes all over your code. Sometimes you might be using the same CSS class both for styling and uh, functionality. Good luck when you remove the styling and then suddenly your scripts break. And in a bigger applica application, it can easily happen that it's barely maintainable at some point because um, uh, maybe you are including all JavaScript in a bundle. Then you have different pages, which happen to have the same selector. Oops, suddenly the code runs on something it shouldn't run on. Yeah, not great. Another problem with jQuery, of course, is there are lots of extensions. Some are very old, so you might get some subtle side effects and bugs. So mm, maybe not so amazing sometimes. Then Ajax. The idea of Ajax is, of course, great, but the XML HTTP request API is absolutely horrible. I'm sure most people here agree with it. I mean, you have to instantiate the object. Uh, you have to, uh, yeah, you have to put a callback. You have to remember that ready state three or four means that it actually succeeded. There's no constant for it. And yeah, callback hell, of course. Then nowadays, luckily, you have fetch, which is supported by all major relevant browsers, which isn't bad can still be improved a bit, like you can't quickly build a query string from a dictionary, but it works fine. And there's stuff like Axios instead. But then back to the server side, what are you going to respond to your HX request? Are you sending back large chunks of HTML? Because that might be easy. You just render your Chincha template on the server and send it back. And then one line to update is dollar whatever dot HTML response data if you use check query or setting inner HTML. Problem is, nowadays you might want an API. I mean, uh, every uh, bigger web app should have an API nowadays, because at least as a tech-savvy person myself, I like having an API so I can do my own things, especially if uh, tech companies nowadays like to make UIs that are not so great sometimes for technical people. So it would be nice to be able to do my own stuff. OK, let's assume, OK, we want to do an API. Are you going to duplicate your code for the API? because you don't want to return HTML in API. At the same time, you can't just return the data you pass to your render template call for the API, because that's probably an object with way too many data, and not everything you want to actually send to a client. And it might not be JSON serializable at all. Of course, you can use something like Marshmallow, which is nice. You should probably use it anyway. But again, if you need HTML at some point, you probably still have some duplicate code for API and uh, non-API calls. Then JavaScript in general, well, what you usually see a uh, script tag, sometimes even inline JavaScript, or just source URL for static pointing to some file. So it's rarely transpiled between formats, where sometimes people minify it, which is at least something, especially for libraries. And uh, generally, uh, the code I've seen lately looks still looks like something that I've written to support old browsers. I mean, zombies can be fun. I mean, who doesn't like shooting zombies in a game? But well, this particular browser, I don't think anybody likes dealing with it. So yeah, please uh, don't support zombie browsers if you don't get lots of money for it. And let me ask you the thing, if you still support those browsers, or if your JavaScript still contains a var statement, why are you still writing the kind of JavaScript you could have written 10 years ago? I mean, things improved a lot. So yeah, maybe you can do things in a nicer way nowadays. So how to uh, improve all of this? So first of all, you can uh, uh, have use a tool to build your asset bundle. And assets, in this case, can be everything static, basically, for the client. So of course, JavaScript, but can also include CSS, fonts, images, since that thing can all be handled by a tool like Webpack. There are other tools as well, but in this case, we'll focus on Webpack, because I think it's the most no, uh, best known one. Also, of course, use modern JavaScript. Like I said, probably don't need to support zombie browsers. So you can use all the nice new features, ECMAScript 6 and the ECMAScript 2017 and newer standards. Because like this, writing JavaScript is actually fun. And if you do need to support some older browsers, there are tool like bar tools like Babel that can transpile it to, well, old JavaScript, which is not fun to write. But I mean, your tool writes it for you. 
and you don't have to ever touch it, thanks to source maps, even not even by debugging. And of course, you can make the front end reactive using something like React Chairs. So maybe you've tried Webpack out and was like, oh God, configuring Webpack, that's quite hard because you have to write a JavaScript file. And I don't think uh, uh, the typical Webpack config is less than, uh, well, let's say, 30 lines of JavaScript. Of course, you can use it without a config, but then you don't have many of the nice features. Then it's basically a glorified minifier. But let me tell you, configuring Webpack is too hard. No, I don't think it is. Unless you want to do weird things with Webpack, and trust me, uh, we did so things, so being there, done that. It's not fun to debug if something doesn't work properly. But no matter if it's a big complex code or something small, it is boilerplate code in the end. So for a single or two bigger projects, not too bad, but maybe you do many small web apps, basic client version of a microservice. Yeah, then you don't want to repeat this code all the time. And if you then want to update something, you have to do it everywhere. So yeah, not amazing. So the question is, can't we do something like from Webpack import config? I mean, we're writing Python. We like to import stuff. Well, answer is almost. There's a tool called Create React App. And to quote the documentation, Create React App is an officially supported way to create single page React applications. It offers a modern build setup with no configuration. Sounds pretty great, I would say. So uh, what exactly does Create React App do? So first of all, it contains the whole build config inside its own package. So it doesn't clutter your project root directory or any of your files under version control. It does auto rebuilding and hot reloading of the front end, which is great during development, especially if you have the app on the second, your second screen. So you save your file and it immediately updates. And it even comes with its own dev server, which takes care of that. But uh, I think that's enough uh, just talking about uh, facts. Let's maybe dive into the actual code. So we start with a simple Flask application. I think whoever already used Flask in here probably knows this type of application. It doesn't do much, uh, defines a Flask app. In this case, we're only registering two APIs. One simple one that gives you the current time, Another one says it returns a greeting either for a given name or for an unknown person. Of course, these are both things that could be easily done on the client side, but I mean, I needed an example, so here it is. I mean, writing useless code is fun. I think it's it GitHub who actually has a useless code challenge going on right now. So, yeah. Okay, now we want the client side front end. What are we going to do? We are going to call create react app. And luckily, you know, it comes with this tool called npx. Uh, basically, what it does is it downloads the package you specify it to a temporary location, executes it. So that's great because you don't need to uh, install it manually somewhere first. And if you don't have npx, it's time to update your node version because older versions didn't have it yet. And many of the nice things nowadays don't work well with old node versions anyway. So you run npx create react app and well, in a folder client. So it creates the app for you, installs a bunch of packages, which usually does not take a few couple of minutes, assuming you have a decent connection and computer. And it even tells you what you can do afterwards, like to start the front end. Well, we're not going to do that right now, because there's another step uh, I have to think about. Because uh, Flask has a very nice routing system. I'm sure you've seen it. At app root, uh, you define a rule with some placeholders even. And then you can use URL for to build the URLs. The problem is how do you do that in JavaScript? I mean, if it's fully static and you only have a few snippets, what you could do is like putting in a data attribute, which works well, OK for a static URL. If it's dynamic, it won't work because then you probably start doing stuff like string concatenation, tem uh, template literals, whatever, to put your power on there, which is, again, pretty much fully manual. And, uh, for example, if you change the endpoint name in your code, or not the endpoint name, the URL, are you going to remember to update it everywhere in your JavaScript? I mean, you might have tests for both front-end and back-end, 
and yeah, I guess you update those tests, but uh, the tests will still pass, except that now you have different URLs on the two sides. So unless you have tests covering both, uh, the application itself might not work anymore. So yeah, hard-coded URLs are pretty ugly, and even more so if they're dynamic. I mean, you're building a URL dynamically, are you gonna remember to do URL encoding of the param in it? If it's coming from the user, you might have to. So let's install some more packages, because reusing code is great. I mean, uh, first one, a normal Python package, providing uh, some functionality to Flask, and uh, two node packages, and NPM is actually nice enough to update our package JSON that was created by Create React app, so no need to uh, update a requirements text for that one. You only want to put the first one in your requirements text or set up PY. Once we have those packages, we have to hook them up with, as uh, build script hooks them up with Flask. So unfortunately, we still need a tiny bit of boilerplate code here. And this goes to a file called Babel plugin macros, rc.js. So what is Babel plugin macros? This is basically a plugin for the build system that's included by default, which lets you define macros in the code transpilation uh, step. More on that later. In this case, only thing worth mentioning is that uh, the config uh, now specifies that the uh, Flask URLs uh, plugin has an argument URL map, which is the output from calling Flask URL map to JSON, which is a package I installed in the previous step. And what it does is basically writing the whole URL map from the Flask app into a JSON format containing all the details needed to build a URL. Next step we have to do, which is partially because of a bug in Create React app, which uh, so we have to tell it uh, to proxy requests for the API to our actual Flask application. Since, like I said, we have two dev servers, the one from Flask and the one for the front end. And it's a bit annoying that you have to write code for it. I mean, you could use a one-line uh, command in package.json but uh, currently this doesn't work in Firefox because it doesn't send the right header or something like that. So we have to use this boilerplate code. The advantage is we can use an environment variable to override the UL of the Flask dev server in that case. Alternative to this proxying would be using cores. So we simply run it on different ports and just access it through that. Or we could put engines in front of it, but I mean it's development. Especially for a smaller app, you want to keep it simple. No need to have engines there. Yeah. So uh, to summarize what we did so far, first of all, of course, we have the Flask apps that's providing an API and only an API. We have the necessary boilerplate for the React front end, most of which was generated by Create React app, so not much to commit except those two uh, files. And we exposed URL building functionality to our JavaScript code, which we're gonna use soon. And the Create React app dev server is now forwarding API requests to Flask. So let's actually start using some React. First of all, uh, create React app uh, creates this app.js with a small demo page. And uh, in this case, we only add a custom component. So thanks to modern JavaScript, we can actually use import statements, very similar to Python, actually. So we import uh, something called demo from a file demo and instantiate it. Thanks to JSX, it's basically JavaScript where we can have XML-like snippets, and the uppercase uh, tag is basically React component. We don't have arguments for it, so we just put it there. Then what do we put in those this component? First of all, of course, we have to create the demo.js file, have some imports we will need later, but this is React specific. So if you start writing React, you'll quickly see that, for example, you need to import React to use JSX. So what we do related to Flask, first of all, we include the Flask URLs macro, which uh, looks like a normal import, but trust me, it's not. And then in the next lines, uh, five and six, we are actually using something called tag templates, literals, and uh, referencing the two endpoints we defined in the Flask up there. So now we have two things uh, that are somehow related to those URLs. It's actually, uh, both are actually callable to actually build the URL. But first of all, let's add some actual UI, since right now our component is still empty. 
So, uh, like I promised in the abstract, we will use we will be using React hooks. So, what are we doing here? So, first of all, we are defining a hook uh, with a variable a state hook that's providing a field containing well something labeled time and a setter function to actually update the state field. So this is basically when calling set time, it re-renders a component and uh, time will then contain this value. What we then do is called uh, use effect, another hook provided by React. Basically by providing the empty dependency list in line eight, we tell React that this thing runs once and only once after the component has been mounted. So what we do in here, we simply use set and with a generated URL to send the request and then process the JSON. And then at the end, we're building another URL just for testing, this time with an argument. So we could send a request to this one as well. Well, right now we don't to keep it short. Anyway, as soon as we got the time response back, we are gonna render a message which time it is and what uh, the URL for the greeting would be. So I can actually show you how this would look like. And if I reload this page, it will have the current time from the server and the greeting URL built with the argument I put there. So now you might wonder how the hell does all of this work? Well, are you gonna accept this answer? Probably not. So let's go a bit into the code. So the first line uh, when we're importing something ending in dot macro, this tells the Babel macro plugin to actually run some code at build time. But just importing it doesn't actually do something yet. But as soon as we start using the macro, in this case as a tag template literal, so this uh, basically calls and the function provided by the macro at build time and providing a reference to the argument you passed and its AST node. So this actually triggers the URL we're writing. Uh, what this thing is replaced with, I'll show you in a moment. Anyway, if we call this function provided by it, it behaves basically like calling URL for with the name equals snake keyword argument. If you're curious now, this is the code that the macro actually generates. It looks as ugly as you would expect from generated code, but luckily you never have to see this until, unless you actually look in the generated code files. And it would be even uglier if there had been space to actually put all the building rules to generate the URL. But again, that's uh, Flask internal, so no need to actually look at them manually unless you write a plugin to build URLs. So let me show uh, the demo I already showed you. Now, uh, important part, that you can actually contribute to this project. It's on GitHub on, under the MIT license or in the Indica organization called JS Flask URLs. Yes, I'm not great at making up fun any names, so it's basically describing what it does. How could you contribute? Well, you could really use some documentation. Right now, we only have two small example apps. And yeah, I don't like writing documentation, but maybe somebody uh, likes doing it, so you're welcome. And uh, some guy on IRC actually told me using the Babel macros, it would be possible to define TypeScript stops. So if you used it in TypeScript, you could uh, get the proper typing. I'm not using TypeScript myself, but maybe somebody's interested in using TypeScript, so another thing to contribute. Or of course, you can just start using it and maybe, hopefully not, find some bugs in it. Why should you contribute? Well, you can brag about having contributed to a CERN project. So uh, there, uh, to stay in the topic, there are some other nice stuff to show you. First of all, this thing also comes with uh, Babel plugins that doesn't use macros for the URL building. Instead, it would uh, give you a way to import the URLs like this. I mean, it has the same features as a macro version, but you need to actually have access to the Webpack and Babel config, which you cannot do manually easily with create React, app, create React app, unless you actually eject the config, which makes it a bit more messy. And honestly, this is a version I wrote because initially I didn't know about mac the macro plugin. So no idea if you'll actually keep maintaining this one or switch our own project to the macro version as well at some point. I mean, one less package to maintain. Then if you do a real application, you need some validation on the server side. Please don't use WT forms to validate your API requests. There's WebArcs, it uses Marshmallow internally. It's really great. 
also very quick responding to bug reports and contributions. So a great project to use, I think. For form handling and validation on the client side, there is something called React Final Form. It's also very efficient, very lightweight. Nowadays, even uses React hooks. Using it for my main project as work, and it works great. And uh, since this example was pretty short on uh, my GitHub account, I actually have a bit more in-depth example. And this also includes some details on how you would actually generate a production bundle and showing some different ways about how you can do things. And this demo looks like this. So yeah, if you update, you see it gets the current time from the server. Or you can go here. And you can put emojis. So it shows me the URL it will generate. And if I call the API, I'm getting back a response, including a very pretty emoji. And yeah, that's uh, pretty much it. Uh, so let's go back to the slides. So if you're now interested in the project or want to get in touch, you can find me on GitHub and Twitter, and of course in IRC on Freenode in the Poco channel, or since the Indico project channel, since, I mean, the pro this library I was talking about is kind of related, so we are reusing the IRC channel. Or, of course, you can talk to me uh, uh, right here. And I even have some pretty hexagonal stickers to uh, give away. So if you have any questions now, feel free to ask. I think we have to see. Thank you, Adrian. Um, we have a few minutes for questions, so if you want, you can go with the microphone. Hi. Uh, I'm using Flask with connection. Is it possible to generate those uh, URL mapping with connection also? I don't know connection, except that I heard about it in a talk two days ago first. <laughs> but basically, what this library does it, uh, the Flask URL package is really exports the function. You can pass a URL map to it, so you don't have to use the bubble magic. So as long as you can uh, dump the URL map to JSON and somehow provide it to the URL builder function from the uh, Flask URL package, you can use it. The bubble thing is just syntactic sugar, so you can use it more easily without having to manually deal with exposing the URL building rules. Okay, thanks. Oh, hi. Thanks for the excellent talk. Um, I just wanted to ask, there's always the option to do things clearly server-side or client-side. For uh, as far as the uh, uh, say user authentication is concerned, assuming a very simple, say, LDAP-based authentication, do you recommend using then Flask login with login required on the API uh, endpoints and then throwing something, passing something, I don't know, a custom error JSON to the to the client, or so doing it's, everything client side. So if it's LDAP, so you have username and password, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it has to be on the server side because I don't think you can do an LDAP login client side. Okay. In any case, it would be very ugly. You probably don't want to expose any of the credentials to connect to LDAP on the client side. So yeah, I would do it server side and then return. Probably would have to use a session token for it. I mean, which is, is super amazing uh, to have a stateful backend with the API. But yeah, should work fine. Okay. And if you use something SSO based, you could do it all client side. Personally, I like having it server side because then you can just send some tokens there. You don't have to deal with the data from SSO. But I think there are pros and cons for both options. Thank you. Um. Short question, maybe not. Okay, thank you, Adrian.